Section One of How to Sing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. How to Sing by Lily Lehman, translated by Richard Aldrich. Section One: Preliminary Practice. All who wish to become artists should begin with studies of tone production and the functions of nose, tongue, and palate. With the distinct and flexible pronunciation of all letters, especially of consonants. Not until he has acquired this preliminary study should a singer venture upon practical vocal exercises. Then it would soon be easy to recognize talent or the lack of it. Many would open their eyes in wonder over the difficulties of learning to sing, and the proletariat of singers. Would gradually disappear. With them would go the singing conservatories and the bad teachers who, for a living, teach everybody that comes and promise to make everybody a great artist. Once, when I was acting as substitute for a teacher in a conservatory, the best pupils of the institution were promised me, those who needed only the finishing touches. But when, after my first lesson, I went to the director and complained of the ignorance of the pupils, my mouth was closed with these words: "For heaven's sake, don't say such things, or we could never keep our conservatory going." I had enough and went. The best way is for pupils to learn preparatory books by heart and make drawings. In this way, they will get the best idea of the vocal organs and learn their functions by sensation as soon as they begin to sing. The pupil should be subjected to strict examinations. In what does artistic singing differ from natural singing? In a clear understanding of all the organs concerned in voice production and their functions singly and together. In the understanding of the sensations in singing, conscientiously studied and scientifically explained, in a gradually cultivated power of contracting and relaxing the muscles of the vocal organs, that power culminating in the ability to submit them to severe exertions and keep them under control, the prescribed tasks must be mastered so that they can be done without exertion. With the whole heart and soul, and with complete understanding. How is this to be attained? Through natural gifts, among which I reckon the possession of sound organs and a well-favored body. Through study, guided by an excellent teacher who can sing well himself. Study that must be kept up for at least six years, without counting the preliminary work. Only singers formed on such a basis after years of work deserve the title of artist. Only such have a right to look forward to a lasting future, and only those equipped with such a knowledge ought to teach. Of what consists artistic singing? Of a clear understanding, first and foremost, of breathing in and out. Of an understanding of the form through which the breath has to flow, prepared by a proper position of the larynx, the tongue, and the palate. Of a knowledge and understanding of the functions of the muscles of the abdomen and diaphragm, which regulate the breath pressure. Then of the chest muscle tension against which the breath is forced, and whence, under the control of the singer, after passing through the vocal cords. It beats against the resonating surfaces and vibrates in the cavities of the head. Of a highly cultivated skill and flexibility in adjusting all the vocal organs and in putting them into minutely graduated movements, without inducing changes through the pronunciation of words or the execution of musical figures that shall be injurious to the tonal beauty or the artistic expression of the song. Of an immense muscular power in the breathing apparatus and all the vocal organs, 
the strengthening of which to endure sustained exertion, cannot be begun too long in advance, and the exercising of which, as long as one sings in public, must never be remitted for a single day. As beauty and stability of tone do not depend upon excessive pressure of the breath, so the muscular power of the organs used in singing does not depend on convulsive rigidity, but in that snake-like power of contracting and loosening which a singer must consciously have under perfect control. Footnote. In physiology, when the muscles resume their normal state, they are said to be relaxed, but as I wish to avoid giving a false conception in our vocal sensations, I prefer to use the word loosening. End of footnote. The study needed for this occupies an entire lifetime, not only because the singer must perfect himself more and more in the roles of his repertory, even after he has been performing them year in and year out, but because he must continually strive for progress, setting himself tasks that require greater and greater mastery and strength, and thereby demand fresh study. He who stands still goes backward. Nevertheless, there are, fortunately, gifted geniuses in whom are already united all the qualities needed to attain greatness and perfection, and whose circumstances in life are equally fortunate, who can reach the goal earlier without devoting their whole lives to it. Thus, for instance, in Adelina Patti everything was united. The splendid voice, paired with great talent for singing, and the long oversight of her studies by her distinguished teacher, Strakosch. She never sang roles that did not suit her voice. In her earlier years she sang only arias and duets or single solos, never taking part in ensemble. She never sang even her limited repertory when she was indisposed. She never attended rehearsals, but came to the theatre in the evening and sang triumphantly, without ever having seen the persons who sang and acted with her. She spared herself rehearsals, which, on the day of the performance or the day before, exhaust all singers, because of the excitement of all kinds attending them and which contribute neither to the freshness of the voice nor to the joy of the profession. Although she was a Spaniard by birth, and an American by early adoption, she was, so to speak, the greatest Italian singer of my time. All was absolutely good, correct, and flawless. The voice like a bell that you seem to hear long after its singing had ceased. Yet she could give no explanation of her art, and answered all her colleagues' questions concerning it with an Ah, je n'en sais rien. She possessed unconsciously, as a gift of nature, a union of all those qualities that all other singers must attain and possess consciously. Her vocal organs stood in the most favourable relations to each other. Her talent and her remarkably trained ear maintained control over the beauty of her singing and of her voice. The fortunate circumstances of her life preserved her from all injury. The purity and flawlessness of her tone, the beautiful equalization of her whole voice, constituted the magic by which she held her listeners entranced. Moreover, she was beautiful and gracious in appearance. The accent of great dramatic power she did not possess, yet I ascribe this more to her intellectual indolence than to her lack of ability. End of section one.